All right, let's get back into it. This is part two, antimicrobial, same PowerPoint. We left off on slide 51. So we are going to continue with the other beta-lactam drugs. And you'll notice those are here. So this is, we've gone through this for ha first half of the table. And like I said before, please keep the organization straight on these. Um, this sometimes gets students. And, um, and part of that too, I mentioned this during the academy, but um, your board questions, I'm sorry, when you have your board exams, the questions there will sometimes refer to these by their mechanism of action, or they'll refer to them as, you know, for example, they refer, refer to um, beta-lactams, and you have to know what, what, the, what does that mean? Or they may refer to an antimicrobial as in, inhibiting cell wall synthesis, um, and so which drugs are under that category. So that's part of the reason I do it. To me, it's it was a, at first I didn't, and I didn't really like it, but because it's on your boards, I definitely don't want surprises on your board exams. Um, and I want you guys to do well on your boards, want 100% pass rate. So um, hopefully that, that'll happen. <laughs> so let's get into it. Astrionam, it's a uh, monobactam. You'll see it, it's given IV. Um, this does not have any activity for gram-positive nor anaerobic. So this is only should only be prescribed for the gram-negative infections, or we suspect gram-negative. Okay, that was bothering me. So I changed this. It's beta lactams. Um, you don't have to worry here with the cross sensitivity. So that's that's good with estriol name. Um, again, gram negative only. So definitely uh, useful for gram negative rods, but um, it is usually reserved um, for more severe infections. Um, but so more life threatening infections. Note here too. Again, put a star here. It's it is effective um, for pseudomonas. So that is something. Also, um, Club CL. You may see that sometimes too. Adverse effects, um, we touched upon this a little bit. So sometimes a, a bacteria can be really good at killing bacteria, or I'm sorry, an antimicrobial can be really good at ki killing bacteria, and sometimes it kills the good bacteria. So when that happens, you can have an overgrowth of C. diff, for example, and end up in pseudomembranous colitis, um, or uh, candidiasis, so an overgrowth of fungus. Um, so again, really good at wiping out bacteria may actually... Um, kill too much of the good, the healthy uh, gut flora bacteria. Carbapenems, so there is four of those. And um, so these you just have to um, memorize, not too many, but so four of those, they all end in this penem ending. So I, hopefully that'll help you guys remember those. And uh, please note here that any penem actually comes, um, well, it needs to be given with celo Celestatin or Kylastin, Kylastatin, I'm sorry, Kylastatin, a um, couple different pronunciations on that. And the good news is for you guys, you, they do come in a, they do come together from the manufacturer. So the, um, the brand name on that one, which a lot of times, again, not for testing purposes, but just for um, reference out in the clinic is Primaxin is the brand name on that one. So you may hear people refer to it as Primaxin, um, but it is given in combination and the reason it is given in combination is because the chylastatin prevents renal metabolism of imipenem, um, and it actually um, competitively inhibits a enzyme in the kidneys that uh, normally would uh, metabolize the um, the antibiotic. So it helps it to be more more effective. Very broad spectrum, including anaerobes. So you gram positive, gram negatives, and anaerobic coverage. Um, so this would be good if maybe you had a mixed anaerobic and aerobic infection. So you'll see that this is a very broad, uh, broad spectrum, broad gun. So it's, it's people say it's a shotgun approach or it's like casting a wide net. Um, so a lot of times out in the infectious disease, or you see this in the hospital when they're not suspect, they're not sure what specifically the patient has, but they want to cover um, anaerobic and aerobic infections and they want to cover gram positive and gram negative you'll see them start with this once they get their cultures back they typically will um, maybe take them off this medication and then give a more specific therapy this again hits pseudomonas so put a star by that except for erdapenem so all of these hit pseudomonas except for this one here so um, the dumb way that I remember it is, um, oh, carbapenems, they hit pseudomonas, right? 
er do they yeah so er depenum <laughs> this is horrible so i'm laughing at my own stupid joke my wife just she always rolls her eyes when i say that but that's how i remember it whatever it takes to memorize these things make up little stories make up stupid associations or whatever um but it's since pharmacy school er you know does it no it no it does not so erdipenum does not but the other three carbapenems um, will hit pseudomonas so uh, apologies for the bad jokes and stuff the, the class before said i had a lot of dad jokes because i'm a dad i guess i don't know so they, they said i hit one of my dad jokes sorry about that um you may see it in for febrile neutropenic patients um usually in combination with immunoglycoside and then maybe some of the enterobacter infections adverse effects so this is for the whole class um these top for for the whole class. Um, specifically, emipenem is worse or is, has the potential to cause seizures. And again, especially if someone's already prone to seizures um, or if they're on other medications. So we're going to talk about this more throughout the semester, but certain medications can lower the seizure threshold. And what that is, is that's the threshold um, at which a person has a, a, can, can have a seizure. So if you lower the seizure threshold, which again, some of these drugs that I'll note can do that, then you increase the likelihood of a person having a seizure. So if a person's on a medication that's already lowering their seizure threshold and they're given emipenem, again, increased risk for seizures, or if they already have other seizures, et cetera. Um, and these other ones, just read through. Um, GI side effects are pretty common for a lot of um, medications just in general, but nausea and vomiting, uh, the confusion, um, myoclonia, is a movement disorder, myoclonus immune disorder, um, the confusion. Uh, this, you'll notice again the colitis, pseudomembranous colitis. Um, so again, because it's wiping out, they're very broad spectrum, so they will um, probably kill your healthy, or I'm sorry, yeah, a normal healthy gut flora. Um, so when you wipe that out, sometimes you can have an overgrowth of other things. So um, that can be an adverse effect of that. Um, I've had students in the past ask me about that. So you know, you're, you're giving them an antibiotic to help them get better, but then you're giving them, but then you're causing them to have C. diff. Um, you definitely, in medicine in general, but with some of these antimicrobials, you have to do what they call a, a cost versus harm or cost versus benefit analysis. Um, and so a lot of times, if they need this serious of, a, of an antibiotic, it's okay, so to speak, to expose them to the risks of, of a C. diff infection. Um, so unfortunately, it's just part of, of, uh, of medicine that you sometimes have to, you know, and we'll see this again throughout the year where, you know, you're giving these medications that have really bad side effects, but then they're treating disease or they're potentially life-saving. So, so anyways, beta lactamase inhibitors. So this is just a review here um, of some things I already talked about, the clonidulonic acid, sulbactrim, and uh, tazobactam. Um, just know that those um, basically help either potentiate or they're synergistic um, and help the the penicillins in, this, in this, these examples help them uh, be more effective. So, And then good news for you guys, um, they are all commercially available, so you don't have to worry about, um, you know, remembering necessarily to put them together. And then just as a note, these are not active against MRSA. Other cell wall synthesis inhibitors, we have a few down here. Um, they're just kind of miscellaneous. Um, another thing, too, that this re slide reminds me of is there have been students in the past that use other textbooks or use other sources, which is fine um, if you feel more comfortable using something else or reading something else. Or if you have a background in healthcare, again, that's fine. I'm not going to be upset with you that. So in pharmacy school, for example, um, we classified some of these drugs differently. Um, in my wife's medical school, they've had some different classifications. Um, so other PA schools may have different classes. So my point is that with pharmacology, there isn't just one way to necessarily to classify all these drugs. So you may, depending on what other sources you use, um, there was a student last year that he was, um, he liked another source. And a lot of times that the categories that they use there didn't match my slides. But so for testing purposes, um, I do base it off my slides. I'm not going to pull out any weird categories or whatever. So the way that I organize them and the way I present them to you in presentation is the way you're going to be responsible for the for the test. Um, but just so you know, I mean, you look at other textbooks, um, you may see these in other other categories. So um, and that reminds me because these other cell wall synthesis inhibitors sometimes these are in other categories. But but anyways, um, and you know this is bacitrace in here. This is a topical medication. Um, by, and by the way, too, on this table, I don't think I mentioned this before, but the O in parentheses um, just stands for um, oral 
Um, so those are, are those are antibiotics that you can prescribe um, by mouth. Um, and so you see a lot more of those outpatient. You still see them inpatient, um, but you know typically, and you also sometimes see IV outpatient, <laughs> which can be confusing. But so a person has to come back to finish their IV antibiotic treatment. But um, but anyways, but that's what the O stands for on those. Vancomycin. So this is a big one in, in the hospitals, especially for pharmacists. Um, this is one that um, a lot of times either a pharmacist or the pharmacy department will help you dose. Um, so it's not uncommon um, in a facility to, you know, for example, the, the hospital my wife's at right now, she can, for vancomycin, she can just be dosing per pharmacy or dosing as per pharmacy. Um, she may initiate or, or pick a dose or she des definitely, the, you know, you'll need the, to give the indication and, you know, have an appropriate reason why you're prescribing the vancomycin. Um, but, but anyways, and so, and if you ever have any time, and if you're interested in, in kind of the, the background of the dosing and kind of the complexities of it, you know, spend some time, there's probably going to be some pharmacists maybe rounding with you guys on rotations, or there's definitely pharmacists in the hospital and stuff. And, um, most pharmacists are nice people <laughs> like myself. No. And so they may be able to help you guys. But, uh, but for me, for testing purposes, I'm not going to make you guys uh, stress out about the intricacies of the vancomycin dosing. I'd rather you guys know more about what it's used for and an appropriate prescript, you know, prescribing. Um, so in saying that definitely it's a big, it's a heavy hitter with gram positive bacteria and only, so I don't prescribe it for a gram negative. That would be considered inappropriate. Um, and then the good news is too, that it covers aerobic and anaerobic. So you remember earlier, I talked about how PO or by mouth vancomycin is prescribed for an anaerobic infection, uh, specifically C. diff. Um, so PO administration of vancomycin, it doesn't get absorbed. Um, so you're able to hit the, um, the C. diff, which is an anaerobic bacteria. So that's, that's a good thing about that. And then again, highlight, underline, gram positive only. Definitely want you guys to remember that for rotations um, because um, it's just, unfortunately, there's resistance that can happen with, with all these medications, but we're seeing more and more resistance with vancomycin. And so you definitely want to make sure that it's only used when, when, when you need to. And it is also bacterial cytal. Um, as far as mechanism of action goes, like I said, um, it inhibits bacterial cell wall synthesis is a take home point. So definitely remember that. Uh, but more specifically, um, I won't be testing you on this, but you definitely squint at this. It, it, it binds to the D ala, D ala, D ala ala is kind of a fun to say, I guess, terminus. Um, and so these are the two things that it specifically does. Um, you can refer back to that image I had earlier in the slides, but um, again, take home point mechanism of action inhibits bacterial cell wall synthesis. All right, uses. Um, I touched upon this a little bit before already. I mean, definitely gram positive, gram positive, stress that. Um, but it's usually where it's a big, it's considered a bigger gun, quote unquote. You'll hear that in, in antimicrobials in the hospital. We've got to use a big gun, use a small gun, use, a, you know, sniper kind of approach versus a so shotgun approach. So sniper is a very specific versus shotgun. Um, I don't know what all the gun references is. My wife says that it, she, she's from Nepal. So she says Americans are obsessed with guns. I don't know. Um, I think they're cool. No, I don't, I didn't think it was that big a deal, I guess, because I grew up here. But um, yeah, so big guns, it's a bigger gun. Um, and again, because of resistance, you don't want to just use it um, willy nilly. Um, but gram positive, so you'll notice uh, staph aureus or S aureus. And then hospital acquired MRSA. So this is methicillin resistant with methicillin is a type of penicillin. So methicillin resistant MRSA. It's also, you'll hear it pronounced MRSA. Um, so I don't, I didn't learn it that way. Um, I definitely heard, I've heard that a lot in practice, but I refer to it more as MRSA, but MRSA, um, just again, heads up. And then it's not Mr. Saw. <laughs> that was just a stupid, I sorry, another dad joke, um, stupid joke we had in pharmacy school because um, we learned it MRSA and then we heard MRSA and we're like, what's next, Mr. Saw? But yeah, so I haven't heard that professionally at all, but uh, MRSA, MRSA. And then the intercocci species, um, maybe in combination with um, aminoglycosides. Having said that, though, there is um, there has been emergence of uh, VRE, which is uh, vancomycin resistant inter intercocci. So again, unfortunately, part of the part of the resistance. Um, so you, you may see that abbreviation VRE, and that's what that stands for. Um, and then other gram positive bacteria, especially if a person, so they, they may not, um, 
be necessarily reserved if a person is a penicillin allergic um, and it is gram positive, um, again, they can't take penicillin. So the good news is that um, vancomycin is not chemically structured or the clinical structure of vancomycin is not close enough to have that cross sensitivity with penicillin allergic patients like you have with cephalosporins. Um, so it is a potential treatment. Um, I honestly haven't seen that a lot um, just because again, they try to reserve vancomycin um, and they're concerned about resistance, et cetera. But, um, but anyways, it's just, again, textbook and there's definitely rationale there. So you may see that out in practice. And I talked about this a couple of times already, but C. diff, um, C. difficile, wait one sec. Okay, just typo there. So C. difficile, C. diff, cause diarrhea. Um, it is a second line treatment. So um, I definitely want you guys to know that metronidazole, which is generic for flagell, is the first line choice. So metronidazole um, definitely hits anaerobic infections and uh, PO metronidazole is first line choice. So I'll definitely highlight that star that for C. diff cause diarrhea. Um, and then if for whatever reason they're allergic to metronidazole, they can't tolerate it, et cetera, you can then go to PO vancomycin. Um, but again, because of resistance concerns, it's not gonna be your first line choice. So some adverse effects that you have to be concerned. So nephrotoxic, definitely put a star by that. And that's part of the reason that usually pharmacies doses it. You definitely wanna monitor the renal function. May not be appropriate to give depending on the renal function, um, but definitely nephrotoxic. Uh, the ototoxicity too is a concern, um, but I definitely, want, I mean, know all of these adverse effects for testing purposes, but as far as out in practice and kind of clinical implications, definitely, definitely. Um, I want you guys to be thinking about the kidneys when you are prescribing and or see vancomycin on a patient's chart. So, and I've had some questions in the past from students because I say, you know, always think about the kidneys when you're talking about vancomycin and you guys are smart and you have good questions and you're always stumping me. So <laughs> one of the times that I got stumped was uh, they asked me, so with PO vancomycin, are you concerned about the kidneys too? And I was like, because they're like, you had said that, you know, you don't have to worry about it, it being absorbed or systemic exposure. And I was like, yes. And so um, definitely good, good on the students, good form of logic. So with PO vancomycin, you don't need to be concerned about the nephrotoxicity. Um, so it's, it, and again, it's going to kind of depend on the patient. So everything in medicine, unfortunately, is patient dismissed. So with oral vancomycin, there's very little systemic exposure, meaning there's very little absorption. That doesn't mean that it's absolutely not absorbed. So again, for for testing purposes, boards, etc., cetera, um, you don't have to oral, you don't have to renally adjust. You don't have to make dosing adjustments based on renal impairment versus IV. You definitely need to make um, dosing adjustments based on renal impairment. Um, but out in practice, you know, if it's just going to really depend on that patient. How horrible are their kidneys? And then also, too, are you giving PO vancomycin? Can you not give the PO metronidazole, right? Okay. But anyway, so, yeah, great question um, from a, a previous student. Um, but, yeah, so textbook with the oral vancomycin, you do not need to make dosing adjustments based on renal impairment. But with IV, you definitely do, and you definitely want to be thinking about nephrotoxicity. Um, the Redman syndrome is another one. It's, again, kind of textbook. You see it on your boards, um, et cetera. Um, but it's basically it's flushing. It causes it can cause a lot of flushing um, in the skin um, when it's given when the IV is given too quickly. And it's basically because there's an over um, over release of histamine. Um, however, and so my wife, interesting enough, my wife just saw this recently in in her hospital she works at. It can sometimes happen when the IV is given slowly too. So just you know every patient's different, but just in general, again textbook. It's when it's IVs given too quickly, you can have the potential for red man syndrome. So again, that's definitely one of those things you want to remember for exam purposes. Um, but then also just out in practice, um, you need to know that um, it unfortunately can just happen with with this drug just in general, just depending on how sensitive the person is. And so um, everybody responds to medications uh, differently. Phosphomycin. So this one is... Um, is interesting. It's it kind of kind of by itself, but again, mechanism of action inhibits cell wall synthesis, um, bacterial cytal. Um, so the, definitely, you can categorize it as, the, as that. Um, it can be used for uncomplicated lower UTIs in women. Um, it has an off-label use to be used in complicated UTIs in men, um, but that is off-label. And, and by the way, so if you guys don't 
have a healthcare background or haven't had this before, I'm sorry. Um, so a labeled use is um, a use that is is documented and, and is um, recorded by the FDA. And so it's an FDA approved use. So an uncomplicated UTI is an FDA approved use. Um, off label means that it's not an FDA approved use, but that it's something that practitioners um, will do, um, will prescribe, you know, PAs, physicians, nurse practitioners, et cetera. And it's something that's been deemed safe by this, you know, healthcare community, the scientific community, et cetera. Um, and it's something that basically, because what happens is when the, the drug's getting approved um, through its formal process, um, they have to submit, you know, formal uses that they're going to be prescribing this medication for. And that's where they get their FDA approved uses. So to get an FDA approved use, you actually have to go through the FDA, f fill out paperwork, et cetera. The off-label uses, it's usually... Um, something that's maybe not worth the company's time and energy to get the formal recognition from the FDA. Um, so, so for example, for phosphomycin, the off-label use is the um, uh, UTI, a complicated UTI for men. Um, so, you, so you may see that. Um, it's, it, it's not prescribed a ton, um, even though it can be effective for UTIs. Um, one of the reasons is there's no a generic equivalent. So the, it's, isn't it more, can be more expensive and sometimes insurance companies don't cover it. Um, so I don't see it prescribed a ton. Uh, every once in a while, and, you know, it's definitely, it has its use. So it's not, um, uh, you know, it's not... It's not that it can never be prescribed. The other kind of interesting thing about it too, and I don't know if this is part of the reason it's not um, prescribed a lot. It actually it comes in a it's a packet of uh, powder, um, orange flavored powder or whatever, and um, or they have different flavors. But and you have to mix it with cold water and you drink it. Um, and so I don't yeah that's also too. It just we don't carry it a lot in farm. I haven't seen it a lot in pharmacies, but but anyways, you guys may still see it. And I want to make sure you have all the all the drugs. Um, regardless of, and then some adverse effects here, um, you know, some GI effects, uh, dizziness, and then maybe some muscle weakness here too. Bacitracin, um, this one I mentioned too is uh, topical. Um, so this is one that, and I don't know if you guys have any derm experience or any uh, people want to go into derm, but uh, maybe using this, I mean, you use this a lot in, in a lot of uh, practices too. But um, this one is a lot of times given in combination with polymyxin and or neomycin ointments. Um, so this will help with uh, skin infections or superficial infections. Um, they also make it in, um, in uh, for eye drops or ophthalmic use. Um, they also make a IM form, um, but it's never, it should never be given IV, but they do have an IM. Um, one that can maybe be used not as popular. It's usually more popularly prescribed uh, for topical, but um, you but you may come across that as an IM only. So this is one of those you do not administer IV just because of the way it's formulated. And then uh, you'll notice too that it, it helps with um, gram positive infections. And you also see it too with like scrapes, burns, minor cuts. Um, yeah, just, and then you can also find this in some of the over the counter uh, preparations. So. Um, just check those out. Um, and then one quick note too with, with over-the-counter products, I, I will be mentioning those here and there um, throughout, um, but I don't um, I don't want you guys to stress too much about them. There, there are some instances where I will mention over-the-counter. I will want you to make sure that you know that they're over-the-counter, um, but but don't don't stress too much about then going and digging and seeing it, trying to find everything that is over-the-counter. Um, but these can be used over-the-counter. And you see, you can find these at whatever H E B and stuff. All right, tables, table time. I like these tables a lot, so I would definitely put a star by this table. It's a big table. It's on three slide, yeah, three slides. So it's a big table. I know it's a lot of met of of information, um, but it has the drugs listed here. Um, it's mechanism of action right above it, um, which is I think nice. And then adverse effects, so ones to worry about, ones to think about. Um, so definitely pay attention to those. And then contra contraindications. So you notice the contraindication um, for all of them is going to be hypersensitivity, which is nice um, that, you know, and then this one too, it notes the ACE trio name, like I mentioned, you don't have to worry about the cross um, hypersensitivity. Um, but hypersensitivity definitely for contraindication for all of those. You can go ahead and put it, that as a contraindication for all antimicrobials. 
Um, and then really, too, in pharmacy school, we were taught hypersensitivity. If a person is allergic to a medication or if it causes a, um, a, uh, a hypersensitivity reaction, then you shouldn't prescribe it. But definitely for the antibiotics, you want to be thinking about those and the specific ones I highlighted. Um, and then you notice, too, pay attention to the generations. Go ahead and add fifth generation. I, I added that, that one slide there. Um, and again, more of the same here, but um, this is a good slide. I know there's a lot on it, but definitely spend time with us. Look at this, um, add it to your notes, add it to your outlines, add it to your charts if you're making charts. Um, definitely pay attention to this. Now we have a couple of drugs that affect cell membrane. Um, so again, this is how I want you guys to categorize them, but you may see them in other um, categories for other textbooks. So this is kind of nice, only a couple to worry about here. Daptomycin. Um, this one, as far as mechanism action is concerned, um, so it um, it binds to the components of the cell membrane of susceptible organisms, and then it causes rapid depolarization, inhibiting intracellular synthesis of DNA, RNA, and protein. Um, so then it is bacterial cytal in a concentration-dependent manner. Um, so you do want to make sure you're dosing it appropriately. Um, and then it's similar bacterial spectrum to vancomycin, so you guys will remember that. What is that? Gram positive, um, so so think of this being used for um, gram positive infections. So um, for example, maybe use and I think oh we have them here. Okay, yeah. So for skin and skin structure infections um, that are more complicated, um, usually so things that um, things that you could think of are Staph aureus, um, Streptococcus pyrogens. Um, so some of those. Um, <clears throat> And also you may see it being used for Staph aureus uh, bacteremia. Um, so that is something that uh, sometimes it's, it's um, can be prescribed for. And, and then j just note too that it's, just, it's not indicated for the treatment of pneumonia. So that is something that you should not be using it for um, and something that shouldn't be prescribed by, be prescribed for rather. You'll notice here too that it can be used for VRE. I talked about that a little bit earlier. And then it MSSA or MRSA. So um so some, some uses there. Adverse effects, so GI, definitely, again, you'll, you'll see that with a lot of these. Um, diarrhea, um, it may also cause some anemia, uh, peripheral edema. Um, it's almost up to, it's about 7% of, of patients, and so if that's an issue for patients or that's something you need to watch out for, uh, maybe a little more common. Um, electrolyte disturbances, again, something you'd want to monitor if the patient's on this medication. Um, and then renal failure. That's something that's it's not as common. It's a rare but serious. Um, it can cause renal insufficiency. Um, so that's something to th take in consideration, rare but serious. The other one, too, is it can have some negative um, hepatic effects. Um, so ab it can cause abnormal hepatic function test. Um, again, rare but serious. Um, and then it also increased serum alkaline phosphates, rare but serious adverse effect for the um, for this medication. So and as far as dosing goes, um, you do need to make dosing adjustments for renal impairment because of this uh, risk of renal failure. Um, however, you do not need to make um, dosing adjustments for hepatic, infail hepatic impairment, rather. But, um, but definitely, um, because of the renal failure potential, um, you need to be thinking about the kidneys with this medication as well. So again, kind of similar to vancomycin. It talked about how the, the, um, the similar spectrum to vancomycin, we can also make that that kind of uh, stereotype in your head that daptomycin, you also need to be worried about the kidneys when you're prescribing it or when you're seeing it being used. And why I say that too is because sometimes, I mean, definitely as a student, but then even as a practitioner, um, some of the things I'm going to tell you about, so uh, PAs aren't allowed to prescribe every medication that's out there. So for example, they can't prescribe C2 or can, um, certain types of controlled substances, which we'll talk about more in, in later lectures. Um, but I feel like it's important for you guys to still learn about those drugs um, because um, I feel like just because you can't prescribe something doesn't mean that you shouldn't know about it. And um, more specifically, you will probably have patients who are on some of these medications that you can't prescribe. Or So for example, maybe you're not prescribing daptomycin, but then there is a patient that you're following in the hospital, or you're helping cover, or you're helping someone, you know, you're covering someone in a nursing home or something. And so um, I try to be mindful of that and, and expose you guys to all that. And I guess part of it too is as a pharmacist, I don't prescribe, but I know a lot about drugs. So I feel like um, that's also where I'm coming from too. I want you guys to know these things just because as a pharmacist, I just see the chart or I see the prescription profile 
Um, and it's not necessarily something I'm prescribing, but so if I see a person on deptomycin, I want to be thinking about their kidneys, right? <laughs> um, because it can have an uh, adverse effect um, with that. Polymyxin B, um, I talked about a little bit, so for topical infections. So uh, mechanism of action here is um, it binds to the phospholipids, it alters permeability and damages the bacterial site, I'm, I'm sorry, bacterial cytoplasmic membrane. And this causes leakage in the intercellular constitutes. So it basically pokes holes in the bacteria and then it's, you know, unable to live that way. It is bacterial cyto, like I said, it's killing it, it's killing the wall of the, the and then it's only should be used for gram negative bacteria. So definitely highlight that, only used for gram negative. Okay, this is interesting. So this is one that I feel like you'll see a lot being used topical. Like I said, topical, gram negative. Um, it's main use, I put that there, um, because that's probably majority of the time you're gonna see it. They do make non-topical preparations. Um, so they make IM and IV and intrathecal, um, but there is a lot of, um, a lot of restrictions on it, um, definitely reserved for life-threatening infections, and that are things that are resistant, and it's really last line. Um, they have a ton of bo a boxed warnings on it, so it's a very dangerous drug when it's... So topically, it's not that dangerous. I don't want to scare you guys, and you never <laughs> prescribe it for topical uses. Um, what I'm talking about is um, the box warnings are mainly due to its IV and IM and intrathecal um, administration so so for example they actually have a box warning on appropriate use so when the drug is given im iv or intrathecal it should only be in hospitalized patients and it needs to be have constant supervision by a physician so again that's the language from the fda um, that they have to have it so it needs to be in a medical facility um, the nephrotoxicity is another box warning so it's very nephrotoxic um, and so that's another thing that it's also neurotoxic um, and so again, box warning level. So the FDA doesn't put box warnings on everything. And they, it's not just, we're not just talking about adverse effects here. This is, you know, serious, um, things that they need to warn prescribers about. So box warning for appropriate use, nephrotoxicity, neurotoxicity. Um, this medication when it's also, when it's not given topically has a lot of drug interactions or potential for drug interactions. So there's also a box warning about its drug interactions. Um, and there's a long list, but, um, it, and I guess I, I I'll, I'll just go ahead and read you the list, but don't stress about it, but it's just basically there's drug interactions. And these are the ones that the back, that the, um, FDA listened list listed explicitly. So bacitracin, streptomycin, neomycin, canamycin, genomycin, tobermycin, amikacin, um, cephloridine, Paramycin, viomycin, and colistin are the ones that they so for d severe drug interactions um, because they increase the risk of nephrotoxicity and neurotoxicity, which they already had box warnings on. So again, um, don't be scared about using this topically. But again, IM IV um, definitely I wouldn't recommend you just prescribing willy nilly. And probably the good news is too that I mean the hospitals will probably have it restricted too. They won't just have it on a shelf there where people nurses can grab and stuff and give it. It's going to be, you know, in a special part of the pharmacy or whatever. It's not going to be on the Pixis machine or whatever. Um, and then there's also a warning for neuromuscular block blockade. So again, IV, um, IM, etc. Not topically, but you can have the risk again. Box warning for a neuromuscular blockade. So, um, a lot of lot of bad stuff there to, to think about if you are not prescribing it topically. Protein synthesis inhibitors. Okay, so these are um, all protein synthesis inhibitors. Specifically, these inhibit the 30S ribosomal subunit, and these hit the 50S ribosomal subunit. So make sure you know which ones go um, where. Um, but then again, for kind of take home take home point for testing purposes. These are all considered protein synthesis inhibitors. Um, and the reason I'm again, wanting you to know if they're 30 S or 50 S is again, I've seen some board practice questions where they refer to these, um, specifically. So I don't want any, you guys to have any surprises there if you come across those. So protein synthesis inhibitors, just in general, um, so just kind of in a nutshell, just, just look through this. Don't stress, too much about, you know, memorizing the steps of this or anything. I won't make you reproduce this, um, but just basically it in inhibits bacterial protein synthesis um, and then disrupts life for the bacteria, basically. So, um, so anyways, that's kind of in a nutshell. 
first off, we have the aminoglycosides. Um, these all add in, end in sin, so that may help you guys. But um, amicacin, gentamicin, streptomycin, and tobramycin, those are the aminoglycosides. Um, mentioned before, 30S, uh, they are bacterial cytal. They do kill a bacteria. Um, and then there are multiple mechanisms of resistance. So you will see resistance with these antibiotics, unfortunately. Adverse effects. So definitely put a star by both of these. Um, and for whatever reason too, like it seems like with the aminoglycosides and the ototoxicity, um, those are ones again have come up on, I've seen on uh, board reviews, etc. I think it was even on one of my board <laughs> exams is with pharmacists as so like aminoglycosides, auto autotoxicity, ototoxicity. Um, so, and then also too, definitely nephrotoxicity. Um, especially in the elderly population, you need to be mindful of this. So again, I don't know where you're going to end up practicing, but um, sometimes even happen, you know, you'll cover your friend has works at a nursing home, and you're going to cover their patients when they go on vacation or something. But so it's definitely good to still learn about um, geriatric population. If you say, I'm never going to work with the elderly. Um, but so physicians, physician assistants don't uh, dose adjust. Um, and so definitely need to think about renal adjustments with these medications. Um, and then again, especially for elderly populations. So just in general, as people age, their renal um, function declines. Um, so this aminoglycosides, nephrotoxicity, and ototoxicity. And just so you know, too, the nephrotoxicity, it depends on what study you look at or, or what textbook you look at, but it's 10 to 20%. Of patients can experience nephrotoxicity. So again, dep depending on appropriate dosing, depending if they're geriatric or not. Um, so those are definitely something I want you guys to remember. And then the other thing too with ototoxicity, it a lot of times is reversible. Um, so the person may have some t tinnitus or hearing loss, or they may have vertigo, uh, lightheadedness, nausea, ataxia associated with ototoxicity, but typically it's reversed upon discontinuation of the antibiotic. So definitely um, clinical management point to whatever if a person is experiencing ototoxicity or any signs and symptoms like i said vertigo um then just go ahead and de they definitely need to be dc'd um from the aminoglycoside and then it should the hearing loss should be reversible and the symptoms should go away so um patients freak out and and practitioners too i mean as a pharmacist i freak out but the good news is that it should be reversible most of the time you're going to be seeing these prescribed im or iv um, and because they don't have good absorption from the GI tract. Um, you sometimes have to monitor the, the drug levels. Um, they can be prescribed once a day. So this is all just kind of FYI stuff. Don't stress too much about that. But, um, you know, they are eliminated via the kidneys. So definitely, I definitely want you guys to remember the, the kidneys and think about the kidneys when you're thinking about aminoglycosides. Pharmacodynamics. See, I told you you see dy dynamics and kinetics again, but again, not don't stress too much about it. Definitely pay attention to the mechanism of action. Um, and like I said, it's basically, it, it hits the 30S ribosome proteins. Um, they're not effective against anaerobes, so note that. Um, and then, uh, the, again, they're bacterial cytal, which we already mentioned earlier. And they are synergistic with beta-lactam antibiotics. So I mentioned that before in previous slides, but so you will see the aminoglycosides sometimes prescribed with the beta-lactam because of synergy um, and because of their, their coverage or, or, you know, what you're trying to treat. Unfortunately, there are resistance. You have to, be, again, I'm just, I feel like this is ad nauseum. You're going to hear this this whole lecture. I'm sorry, but resistance, resistance, resistance. Um, aminoglycosides are not immune to resistance. Um, and so again, another type of antibiotic you need to be thinking about. Um, so just, just read through that. Don't stress about memorizing that, but it, again, just global kind of take home point with antimicrobials. And I think I've already made it, but, um, resistance <laughs> hashtag resistance. No, I'm kidding. All right. Uses. Um, so here you can actually just put gen general usage um, usages. So this these are actually general usages for the entire class. So um, first we have infections with aerobic gram negative bacteria. So again, so for aminoglycosides in general, um, have that association with aerobic gram negative bacteria. So I've listed some of those for you there. Um, they can be used again for pseudomonas but they're going to be in combination with some other medications. So um, again, put a star by this this one. 
this slide. I like this. Um, and again, I'm not just picking on you guys. I don't. I try not to do just random stuff for you guys to memorize. But um, you, you see Pseudomonas a lot. A Pseudomonas concern and coverage a lot in the clinics. And then for, again, for boards, they want to know which ones cover um, Pseudomonas. So um, in combination, it's, in some of these we've we've already seen before. Um, some we'll talk about a little bit more um, in detail later. And then now we are going, so those ones up to this point were just general for the whole class of aminoglycosides. Now we'll talk about um, some specifics. So streptomycin, um, you may see it being used for tuberculosis. It's We're going to talk about more tuberculosis a little bit more um, later on, but um, it's not one of the first line ones now, according to the CDC, but you may see it sometimes uh, used for TB in combination with uh, some of the other first line anti microbials, um, streptococcal and uh, enterococcal endocarditis, mycobacterial infections, uh, plague, tularemia, and brucellosis, maybe. Then we have amicacin, genomycin, tobramycin. They have uh, good gram-negative coverage. And these are usually given in combination with other medications. So you usually see them with other penicillins or uh, cephalosporins. And then neomycin is a topical aminoglycoside. Um, so this one you can, uh, you'll see in some skin products or they make eye drops or eye ointments um, for this or some, some oint and then skin ointments and skin creams and stuff. Um, and then it's also can be used uh, prophylactically in colon surgery. So they'll give this PO uh, because it's limited systemic um, absorption. So it, it targets the gut before the colon surgery. Adverse effects. So, I mean, the first two I already spent some time on, so hopefully you guys remember that. Um, we saw this in lecture six. So, okay, I'm going in a different order than I went last year. So, I, let me just delete that. Let me do some little movie magic here, real quick. Movie magic. Okay. So, yeah, we know we did not see that in lecture six. This is like lecture two or whatever. Um, okay. So, I spent some time on those. So, put stars by those. The other one, the neuromuscular junction blockade. This is one of those rare but serious adverse effects. Um, so, the nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity are going to be more more common, um, especially the nephrotoxicity, like I said, up to maybe 20%, depending on what sources you look at or whatever. But um, And then especially with elderly, you need to be worried about that. Um, the neuromuscular, blockade, like I said, rare but serious effect. Um, so, and then most patients that do experience such reactions have a disease state and or concomitant drug therapy that interferes with neuromuscular transmission. Um, so for example, myasthenia gravis is an absolute contraindication to, am to aminoglycoside use. Um, but so anyway, so rare but serious, and then those two are just, you know, common and you need to be thinking about all the time with aminoglycosides. Tetracyclines. These, again, I think are easier or um, are more straightforward. I'm not to say easy. Students hate it when I say things are easy, but I'm sorry. Um, more clear cut, more straightforward. Um, students, yeah. And I, and also part of it, too, is I, I sometimes take for granted, you know, my experience with uh, with my education and then my, my work history. But um, I, what I meant to say is these all end in the cycling. So tetracycline, and then they all end in the same ending. So I think that helps, or that helped me as a student um, when it came to memorizing these and putting them in the right category. So tetracyclines, they all end in this cycling ending. So um, some characteristics of it, they chelate with metals. Um, so you guys remember, hopefully from undergrad, chelation just basically means they stick to metals. And so this can come into play um, with drug interactions or, um, you know, that, that can be a concern with these, um, depending on what you're giving it with. Again, it's going to inhibit the 30S protein synthesis, uh, 30S, ribosome 30S. It has a, they have a pretty broad spectrum of action. Um, unfortunately, there is resistance that has emerged and you have to be concerned with. Adverse effects. So kind of related to the chelation or is the, they can cause tooth discoloration. So that is something that um, you will hear, hear patients talk about or you have seen with patients. Um, bone growth retardation too is another adverse effect you have to be concerned about with these. Uh, GI toxicity is one, um, so GI, upset, you know, stomach, nausea, vomiting, etc. And then photosensitivity is one of those that um, definitely one of those, the class of antibiotics, the tetracyclines that you need to be um, cautious about being out in the sun. Um, so as a pharmacist, you typically recommend using um, sunscreen if you're taking these antibiotics for a long period of time or just covering up and kind of avoiding 
um, too much sunlight exposure. So, you know, wearing long sleeves, wearing long pants, etc. Kinetics. Um, so, again, not don't stress too much about this, but again, because they chelate, I mentioned drug in interactions. There's also food interactions that can happen. So this is definitely one that you usually give on an empty stomach. Um, and then you don't want to give with other medications that contain calcium um, and then or iron or antacids, for example. Um, so this is the one that you usually recommend on an empty stomach. So don't drink it with milk, for example, because it has calcium. Um, so yeah, don't, don't stress too much about it, but just definitely keep that in mind that it does, it is a chelator. Um, and that it that can affect its absorption. Distribution, um, you'll notice that they it does distribute to the teeth um, and bones in higher concentrations, and that's where you can have those. That's related to the adverse effects I talked about earlier. So um, this, you know, too, it does go to the kidneys and liver. Um, you will have to make renal adjust, or dosing adjustments for renal impairment, but um, no, it's just the liver, not the. I'm sorry, and, but you do not need to uh, make dosing adjustments for hepatic impairment. And then um, lower concentration CNS adipose tissues, and then it does cross the placenta and is excreted in milk, and so this is an instance where the, um, the baby or the fetus and then the, the breastfeeding baby can be exposed to these antibiotics if the mother's taking them. Um, I mentioned, too, you do need to think about renal adjustments because they are cleared mostly by the kidney. Um, with the exception of minocycline and doxycycline. So these two, um, you don't have to be worried about. So minocycline and doxycycline, you don't have to worry about doing the dosing uh, renal adjustments. or Yeah, renal impairment dosing adjustments for those. Um, so they're a little bit different, and it's based on the kinetics. Mechanism of action, we already went through this um, somewhat. But yeah, take-home point, inhibit the 30S subunit of the ribosome. Pretty broad spectrum, which I mentioned before, um, so a lot of different uses. Resistance, again, something you have to think about. Just read through this in FYI, but again, tetracyclines are not immune to the, um, the problems with resistance. Uses, so we have a whole bunch of uses here. So I'd already mentioned their broad spectrum, so meaning they hit gram positive and gram negative. So here's a list here I'd, I'd read through. Um, note here, Again, for boards, they love asking about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Lyme's disease. So it's like the hiker was out in the, uh, what is it, like the Smoky Mountains or what is it This those in Tennessee? I forgot. But anyways, there was this one board question about some person hiking in Tennessee. And then, but and the answer basically was that you need to give them doxycycline because you're worried about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Or, well, I don't know. But anyway, so um, note those. Again, you'll see those again. Uh, SIA, SIADH, which we'll see... Um, more in the endocrine lecture, but this is inappropriate, the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, you, um, specifically demeclocycline, sorry, you had a drink of water there, demeclocycline. Uh, syphilis and gonorrhea, you may see it as alternative. The plague, so doxycycline again, um, it, doxycycline may be part of the malaria treatment, depends, um, usually not first line, um, can be used for a rosacea, or you st sometimes we'll see these used. Uh, dermatologists will prescribe these for uh, for acne, too. Um, they are also you will see this talk about this again in the GI module. But for H. pylori, the Helobacter pylori eradication, it's part of a cocktail. So with H. pylori, you give a number of different drugs, but you typically give a tetracycline with it. Um, so we'll be seeing that again uh, in the GI module. Adverse effects. Again, GI, as you guys have noticed, um, and C. diff can be a, a, an adverse effect, so, you know, secondary to giving these medications because they, they kill the, the healthy bacteria in the, in the gut. Um, inhibition of bone growth, so a problem for fetuses because it does cross, cross the placenta or breastfeeding children, infants and children. Discoloration of teeth, too, can affect the children that are breastfeeding. Um, and then super infections, unfortunately, candidiasis. Um, and then, like I talked about earlier, the photosensitivity is something. So uh, definitely pay attention to all these adverse effects. Macrolides. These are uh, 
popularly prescribed. So azithromycin, this is the one that's a uh, Z-pack, which you guys have probably come across. Again, I think good for a student, they all end in the thromycin. <laughs> so T-H-R-O, thromycin, uh, they all end in that. So macrolides definitely make that association. You just have three to worry about. And it's ACE, I don't know. So the ACE, so a MAC, person who's a MAC is an ACE, I don't know. I don't know, whatever you want to use to memorize these, but um, that maybe that'll help. Key characteristics, um, they're both static and cytal, um, just depends on the bacteria. Again, they're going to hit protein synthesis, specifically 50S inhibitors, and then they are inhibited by the biliary secretion. So you don't have to be concerned about the, um, the renal impairment as much as you do with other antibiotics we've already talked about. Um, there is um, hepatic elimination, but... Um, you don't need to necessarily make dosing adjustments. Um, you do just need to be concerned if a person has um, a history of, of having liver disease or et cetera. Um, and there is a potential for hepatotoxicity. It's a rare but serious side effect. Um, but, uh, and it's basically you're supposed to d discontinue immediately if there's signs and symptoms of hepatitis. But as far as dosing goes, you don't have to make dosing adjustments. So no dosing adjustments for renal impairment nor hepatic impairment. And then another note on these two, they do make optimal thalmic products, so you will see eye drops, eye ointments, etc., um, for these macrolides. Kinetics. Um, you can give these PO. Um, they're also given IM. Uh, th they are acid liable, some of them, but they're just made different in different ways. They have special coating on them. Um, but don't stress about that. They do hit the CN CNS, so if you are interested in penetrating the CNS, this is good. They also cross the placenta, so you have to be thinking about that with pregnant mothers. Um, excreted in bile, I talked about those implications already. Um, rare but serious um, potential for hepatotoxicity, but um, but it's just more FYI. And then the half-life too, um, just FYI, but you know, is it just, if you, I mean, just kind of FYI, azithromycin has a longer half-life, but uh, don't stress about that for my exam. Mechanism of action, again, a bit over it. Basic take-home point, reversibly binds to 50S ribosomal subunit. Resistance, again, is an issue. Just read through that. Um, and hopefully, <laughs> I don't even want to say it, but yeah, so my point's hopefully been made here about resistance and, and uh, always need to be thinking about that. General uses. So um, mainly gram positive coverage, a little bit of gram negative. Um, these would be a good alternative if a person does have a penicillin allergy. Um, of the macrolides, azithromycin and clarithromycin have broader spectrum, excuse me. I don't know if anyone's ever worked in like a, a radio studio or anything, but they have these cough buttons or they have these... Uh, like sneeze buttons. I feel like I need one of those here. So it's like if I need a cough or something, push the cough button. Anyways, yeah, email me if you've ever worked in a radio. Just out of curiosity. It's no big deal. I know you guys are busy with studying. Don't, don't worry about it. But I was just curious about those. I've heard about those cough buttons they have. But anyways, um, so these are good. As again, just as a general, as the class are good for Legionnaire's disease, mycoplasma pneumonia, and then chlamydia. Um, so I remember I worked at the Chickasaw tribe up in Oklahoma and the health department there. So we gave the medications out for free, but part of it was that you, we had to document that they took it in front of us. And so they had um, a one gram packet that looked like, it looked like Fun Dip. It was like a little, maybe you guys remember that candy, but it was a powder. You open it up, mix it with water, and the patient had to drink it in front of me. And then I had to document and we had to send something to the health department. Um, but yeah, they would come in and it did not taste good. So I have all these mental images um, burned into my brain of people drinking this horrible liquid in front of me as I'm just staring at them. Look, you know, I mean, I would try not to stare and make it too creepy or too awkward, but they would just be there um, and f across the table from me and be like, just please drink it. Some people would sip on it. They take forever. I'd usually just like, hey, I put it in a smaller cup. Like, you know, I don't know if you drink or not, or if you ever had a shot of anything, but just take it like a shot. Just, just chug it and um, get it all down there. It doesn't taste good or whatever. Um, but anyways, and some people try to leave with the packet. They're like, oh, I just, I'll just drink it when I get home. Like, no, sorry, you, you get it for free. You got to drink it in front of me. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, I always associate that this with chlamydia just because of my personal experiences. Um, and then here's some specific uses for each drug. So I mentioned azithromycin, chlamydial infections, um, may also be used for myco mycobacterium avium complex, um, specifically as a prophylactic for patients who have HIV. 
sinusitis, otitis media, um, you'll see that a lot. Um, definitely prescribe a lot of Z-Packs in the pharmacy. And you guys probably have seen those if you have any healthcare experience or whatever, any shadowing experience. Z-Pack, Z-Pack, Z-Pack. Um, but yeah, and I, unfortunately that could be part of the problem with resistance or whatever. So be mindful of it. It's real easy to just write Z-P-A-K, right? It's four letters. It's one of the easiest prescriptions you can write. You can write Z-P-A-K, so Z-Pack, and then U-D just means at, as is a Latin abbreviation for as directed. So Z pack number one, you know, once, number one, UD, one of the quickest, easiest prescriptions you can write probably, but just please don't, don't over prescribe it. Then we have the clorithromycin. Um, this one is effective for H. pylori. So you'll see this part of that cocktail I talked about um, later in the GI module. We'll talk about more in, um, in depth so also infection treated with azithromycin and then it also can help with uh, MAVM intracellular um, the other thing too just about macrolides in general and I, I was kind of joking about it but it's with the z-pack they are good for respiratory infections so so all the macrolides um, that can be an appropriate use for those um, and then the other thing too with the azithromycin you'll probably be seeing this in ICM um, that I forgot to mention here is that um, they can be given or so if a person has a chlamydia infection with a gonorrhea infection, um, they also will be given for that too. So um, I, like I said, I believe you'll be getting that in, in, in ICM more, but anyways, just want to make sure we're clear on that. And then erythromycin, um, Legionnaire's disease, M. pneumonia, neonatal genital or ocular infections, also chlamydial infections. And so this is definitely one that I prescribe a lot in the pharmacy for pediatrics, but it's a little tube of erythromycin ointment. And so it'll be for an ocular infection. You just put a little um, bead of, of the ointment underneath or on top of the, of the eyelid. And then also the erythromycin has similar antibio antibacterial coverage as penicillin D. Um, so I don't know if that helps you guys memorize or not. The other thing to note here too, erythromycin is a little bit different than the other macrolides in that you do have to be more concerned with drug interactions. Um, and so that's definitely something in the pharmacy we'll call about or it may be something. Um, like I mentioned, so if you're giving it for ocular infections and you're putting it on the eye, you don't really get too much systemic exposure. There's not a lot of absorption, um, so not too much concern. So if it's topically, don't worry about drug interactions, but definitely if you're giving it um, and it's there's systemic exposure, so you're giving it oral or whatever, um, you definitely need to be concerned about drug interactions. So add that to this slide. Um, and it's again because of what we talked about during cancer success, the cytochrome P450s. Um, so er er erythromycin actually inhibits those enzymes. And so because of that, lots of drug interactions. So erythromycin, link in your head, drug interactions. And uh, then here we have it again, adverse effects mentioned erythromycin is unique in that it does cause drug interaction in interactions. So here's a list of those uh, for you guys um, because it inhibits that. Um, for the class of macrolides, GI adverse effects, and then um, hepatotoxicity, I talked about that. It's a rare but serious adverse effect. So any signs or symptoms with any of these drugs of uh, hepatic toxicity, you want to DC the um, macrolides. And then unfortunately too, it can cause the pseudomembranous colitis. Um, so that's some, another thing because it's killing the healthy gut bacteria. Okay, and we're going to stop here. Again, I'm trying to chop this up so it's not too long. Um, and then also my computer's overheating and it, the battery's almost dead. I forgot to plug it in. So um, my bad, or as they say in Latin, mea culpa. Um, but yeah, so we're going to go and stop here. And then we'll pick up, so this is the end of part two, and then we'll pick up with this slide, the other protein synthesis inhibitors in part three. So thank you guys for your time and attention. Please feel free to email me if you have any questions. All right, have a good day. Bye.